All right, so for today's Throwback Thursday, I wanted to focus in on Ross Perot and his bid for the presidency within the context of 1992. Explicitly, I want to focus on his sort of uh, contention with uh, NAFTA. Of course, he firmly aligned himself as a third party candidate and ran for bid for the presidency against George Bush the elder as well as Bill Clinton and of course Bill Clinton despite the fact being a Democrat was pro free trade and was pro NAFTA therefore that's the distinction and or crucial distinction that corresponded in propelling Ross Perot for his bid for presidency it was that distinction between Clinton supporting NAFTA while Ross Perot didn't and it actually did quite well for him during the election but within the context of this throwback Thursday I wanted to explicitly focus in on his Larry King interview that he had alongside Al Gore where they both sort of brought up pro and con arguments in regards to NAFTA but some of the arguments that Ross Perot was making was quite progressive and or ahead of its time within that sort of early 1990s historical framework because of course we see and or saw within the context of the 2016 as well as 2020 presidential let alone I guess democratic primaries election we saw Bernie Sanders of course making similar arguments in terms of how the outsourcing of job and or jobs have left certain states socially and economically abandoned especially as it pertains to the Rust Belt states such as Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio and Pennsylvania which are states that used to be thriving in terms of having a prominent manufacturing and or steel mill sector that once employed thousands let alone the fact that those occupations not only employed thousands but also had strong benefits such as health care benefits as well as strong unionization so what we see today and we're going to look at here is uh, Ross Perot effectively making strong arguments that are opposed to Al Gore in this instance and the Clinton administration but also making some uh, progressive and bold statements in regards to some of the outcomes that can manifest from the outsourcing of jobs or with the support of NAFTA. Here's the first clip. Are you a free trader always was? I am a free trader now. Do you favor some sort of NAFTA? Absolutely. Then what's your rub? The problem is this is not good for the people of either country. You is that McKeever? But yes. I think the important thing for everybody watching this show tonight to remember, this is not an athletic contest. This is not a question of who wins, whether I win or the vice president wins. This is a question of do the people of the United States and the people of Mexico win. Now that's the important issue, and I'm sure we're in agreement on that. My concern is very simple. I look at many years' experience in the McKeela Dora program, and These are here the is what I see. This, we have a lot of experience in Mexico. I've been accused of looking in the rearview mirror. That's right. I'm looking back at reality, and here is what I see after many years. Mexican workers' life, standard of living, and pay has gone down, not up. After many years of having U.S. companies in Mexico, this is the way Mexican workers live all around big new U.S. plants. Now, just think if you owned a big U.S. company and you went down to see your, newest, your new plant and you found slums all around it, 
your first reaction would be, why did you build a plant in the middle of slums? And your plant manager would say, oh, there were no slums here when we built the plant. You say, well, why are they here now? They said, this is your, where the workers were. Your agreement were. would have been a different NAFTA, right? This would you be a NAFTA that, that gives the, the people. Sense. Now, what are the rules here? I answer his no, questions no. or yours. Well, mine or both. With this Okay, but the, the point being, this is, there it is. Here it is on a more personal basis. Livestock in this country and animals have a better life than good, decent, hardworking Mexicans working for major U.S. companies. And here's one just to look at. Now, here's a good, decent man working his heart out, making his cardboard shack, and the cardboard came from boxes that were used to ship the goods Can down Can I there. say something about this? this I didn't interrupt you. Okay. Furthermore, I want to also point to a clip uh, in regards to a statement that Ross Perot makes within his uh, analysis during the second presidential debate. And some of the overtones here are quite similar in fashion to some of the arguments that Bernie Sanders has made within the 2016 and 2020 Democratic primaries when he talked about how shipping these jobs overseas corresponded in maximizing the profits for those on the top, be it plutocrats. However, those that uh, often depended on those jobs have now went from secure labor, which was found in the manufacturing and or steel mill sectors, to now precarious and or dispensable labor that nowhere near has the strong wages devoid of any sort of unionization let alone any sort of health care benefits and Ross Perot makes those arguments within the context of the second presidential debate here's the clip have got to stop sending jobs overseas to those of you in the audience who are business people Pretty simple. If you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south to border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25, let's assume you've been in business for a long time, you've got a mature workforce. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element, making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a job sucking sound going south. So we, if, if the people send me to Washington, the first thing I'll do is study that 2,000 page agreement and make sure it's a two-way street. Uh, one last point here. I called, I decided I was dumb and didn't understand it, so I called the who's who of the folks who've been around it. And I said, why won't everybody go south? They said, we'll be disruptive. I said, for how long? I finally got them up for 12 to 15 years. And I said, well, how does it stop being disruptive? And that is when their jobs come up from a dollar an hour to six dollars an hour and ours go down to six dollars an hour, then it's leveled again. But in the meantime, you've wrecked the country with these kinds of deals. So there we have it. Ross Perot's analysis during the second presidential de debate where he outlines how if you are paying 12 13 14 dollars an hour for factory workers within the context of the u.s and you can move your factory south of the border and pay a dollar an hour for labor let alone not being concerned with overtime pay providing health care and unionization which plutocrat or which business would not jump on such an opportunity. And of course, we heard those same arguments when it came to Bernie Sanders within the context of uh, both the 2016 as well as 2020 primaries. And we also heard these same arguments from President Trump within uh, the 2016 presidential debate. He was routinely cited as saying that NAFTA was the single worst trade deal ever approved in the United States and he would often bring up statements especially when he went to the Rust Belt whatever happened to your jobs remember when you had these strong jobs and he's absolutely right about that analysis and of course Bernie Sanders had a sort of similar analysis 
when he called the the Trans-Pacific Partnership essentially a continuation of some of uh, the di disastrous uh, trade agreements that have taken place, including NAFTA, CAFTA, and establishing permanent normal trade relations with China. So what we're getting here is within the context of the 1980s, right, with the emergence of neoliberalism, we had increased levels of deregulation and privatization and cuts to social programs under Reagan. That aspect was intensified even further when it came to the 1990s. When we had wages stagnate, deunionization begin to crumble, let alone any sort of benefits found within strong labor that once existed, such as health care benefits. Slowly but surely, we saw that eroding from the 1980s and, of course, to the 1990s. And that was our throwback Thursday for this week, looking at Ross Perot and how he was right when it came to his opposition to NAFTA.